Welcome to the Family Goals Podcast with Davey Polly and Pastor Jay. My name is Joel House, and the purpose of this podcast is to encourage you to grow closer to God, to strengthen your marriage, and to inspire your family to reach its highest potential. Today, we have a very special guest and very dear friend of Davey's, the legendary Coach Mark Rick. Coach Rick recruited and coached Davey at the University of Georgia. Coach Rick shares on his time coaching, his health issues, and his relationship with Jesus Christ. Take a listen. Well, welcome to another episode of the Family Goals Podcast with Davey Pollock and Pastor Jay. We've got a very special guest today, Coach Mark Rick. Very Former, special. Very special. Yeah, best looking 60 year old guest we've had, Coach. Yeah, thank you. 60, <laughs> 62, by the way. Yeah, baby. <laughs> still, still rolling, still rolling. So, was Coach your coach when you played at Georgia? Yeah, Coach recruited me. Um, first class I had, David was part of that class. Oh wow! I was, I was, you know, I was one of those really highly recruited guys that Coach had to have, <laughs> right, Coach? <laughs> yeah, it was one of those things. We we had a few guys that were like that. Thomas Davis being another one. We had two first rounders that uh, I think I think uh, on Thomas Davis Grambling, we had to beat Grambling. Yep. And it wasn't a major battle for you. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Odell was Middle Tennessee State, right? I was right? about to say Odell, the third guy. He was a second-round draft pick, high second-round pick, and he was, uh, like you said, Middle Tennessee. We beat them on uh, on him. So it was interesting, uh, going back to Thomas Davis real quick, Brian Van Gorder, the defensive coordinator, was uh, – you know, it, it, what happens is when there's a coaching change, most of the recruits scatter and there's a few left. And Coach Rodney Garner, who was on the former staff – I kept him on, and mainly because he had like 18 guys he was hanging on to yep. for dear life. And uh, in this recruiting process, well, uh, Coach Van Gorder's was like, well, I'll watch Thomas Davis play basketball. So he he went to his high school basketball game, and he goes, yeah, he, he's a pretty good athlete. I think we'll take him, you know, <laughs> almost an afterthought. And then, you know, he ended up being one of the, you know, an all-pro for years and uh, one of the greatest players in Georgia. And great human. I mean, just oh. great dude. Like he was, he was, he was special. Yeah, that that recruiting stuff. That's that's crazy. Like all the, all the recruiting ranks. South Carolina State for Tim Jennings. Like right. a lot of those guys every we call, year. We called Tim Jennings the night before signing date. He had committed to South Carolina State, as you said. What happened was we went to go see an All Star game to look at an offensive lineman. I think it was. And as the coaches were watching the offensive lineman watching the game, this All Star game, Timmy Jennings took it over. Some not very big guy. Tiny guy. From where he was from. And uh, he was the last guy picked in that class. He was the first guy. He was the last guy picked as far as Georgia was concerned in that class. But he was the first guy drafted in that, cl- in that class. So you never know about them stars, you know. Well, we know we know Davey's kind of mm-hmm. high maintenance. Oh, yeah. Were there some things you had to do to recruit? Did you have to – was there any, like – Special arrangements. Are you talking about made? bags of cash? Is that what you're talking about? I don't know. Bags of cash. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we, I can we, promise we, you we, that we, didn't happen. We use Burger King. <laughs> <laughs> Back in the day, that would worked too, bro. Yeah, we didn't take you to Burger King. <laughs> that definitely would have worked. Oh, uh, shoot. Now, David, uh, David was low maintenance uh, recruit anyway. <laughs> <laughs> not a, Like I said, not a super battle. And uh, I'll never forget David. I'll tell this story on him. He probably would like it, but uh, he that. started. Uh, he started out as kind of a pudgy nose guard. <laughs> we weren't <laughs> sure what to do with the guy. He's backup uh, defensive lineman, interior defensive lineman, right? Yep. With, yes, sir. And uh, Coach Rodney Garner was his coach. Big fan and of mine. During <laughs> during two days, David comes in my office. He's like, Coach, I don't think Coach Garner likes me <laughs> because I don't think I don't know if I'm good enough to play here. He does. He doesn't think I'm very good. And so we had to kind of talk him off the ledge of not just quitting. I don't know if you're ready to quit, but you were thinking about yeah, getting I'm, out of there. That's for sure. Well, and that's why I think all these kids nowadays like it's we all have those feelings like oh, even yeah. no matter how close you are to home like there's something that you're that's going to happen that you're going to go man i used to be the man and this is this right. is hard this stinks that's that's why the transfer stuff man i really i hope they find a way to make people stay for a year right. you know because <clears throat> man w- and when things I'm get sure. tough they're going to want to roll out and, and well, it, yeah. it is supposedly a one-time transfer rule so you can't keep doing it over and over but i, that, I am a little concerned like you are, David, that people won't fight through a little bit of adversity. I mean, that's part of growing up and becoming a man. And uh, when you when you meet resistance and all of a sudden you you run, uh, you tend to run the rest of your life. 
Yeah. And you have plenty. Obviously, you've, you've been around tons of kids, tons of people. Like, talk about your, because I've talked to you about this a bunch of times, but talk about fathering and right. talk about parenting. Talk about right. your role as a coach, right. like, and how you saw, um, you know, an epidemic and, and how to fix it or how, what you think about it. Right. Well, what you're talking about right now is just the, uh, the true epidemic in our country is fatherless homes. Uh, when, you, when you look at the stats of what those kids are up against, it's, uh, they're X amount of times more likely to do anything that's negative uh, because they don't have that leadership in the house. And I can't tell you how many uh, kids that I recruited had a, a single parent home and it was mom. And mom would come to me and say, coach, I can teach him a lot of things, uh, but I can't teach him how to be a man. Could mm. you could you please do that for me? And uh, so that was, you know, I, I took that seriously and tried to do my very best to model what a, uh, what a father looks like. And I, I tried to hire coaches that were married and, and had children, and, and we all tried to model the family unit uh, for our guys. And, and so many of those guys were very attracted to that. Because you can tell them all you want, but if you if you if you show them, uh, then they tend to uh, uh, see it and believe it, and and and, and most times want it. But uh, you know, coaching players and parenting, I think, are really a lot alike. I, I think, um, you know, there's a certain amount of expectations that uh, you have with your children and, and with your players, and and I think it's very important to be. Uh, unified, first of all, at the, at the leadership. You know, if it's a home, it's the the husband and wife got to be on the same page, and they've got to make sure that the, the kids aren't playing one parent over another and all that. They they got to be united. I mean, if a kid comes to dad and he says no, and then he goes to mom and she says yes, that's that creates confusion. And and uh, and or if you say this is not allowed, and you allow it, uh, you know, once a week or. This week it's okay, and next week it's not. They they get confused. I think it's important to be, you know, very clear what the expectations are, and um, and then I think when it comes to discipline, I think there's three facets to discipline. I think I think there's something punitive, like if it's a child, you know, and they're not old enough to understand, you may you may swat their bottom, you know, for whatever it is. So they they got to feel a little bit of a sting, and then then you got to educate them. So you tell them, you know, what they did wrong and why it's wrong, and then you got to love them. So a little bit of punitive, a little bit of education, and then a little bit of love. And uh, But, you know, as you get with older children, um, you know, the love's a little bit different sometimes. You, you, you have to allow them to go through tough times. you got to allow them to, um, to go through some pain because – uh, you want to give them, you know, we want to give them, give them, give them. Well, the best thing you could give them is the what it takes to handle adversity in life down the road. And sometimes we want to ease everybody's pain to the point where they can't handle problems. And uh, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a scary thing sometimes. Well, I think being, being a father, father figure for the players, have you been able to keep a relationship with them like they, oh, they yeah. play well, for my, you? This, this phone here, the, 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 I've got the same phone number from – 2001 when I first took the job at Georgia and I did that because I wanted to stay connected to the players and uh, truthfully uh, my busiest phone day text day besides when I had my heart attack was <laughs> was is Father's Day every year um, hmm. I get hit up by many many of the former players uh, just saying you know happy Father's Day and thanks for thanks for being there for me or whatever it was so you know, it's it's a lot of fun to to go to uh, have that relationship with those guys. That's awesome. Well, and we do we do a, a Bible study with Coach every Wednesday morning, and he's kind of he's kind of our leader. And I've ta I've talked about that on the on the podcast before, and just how much it's it's meant to us. You, you talk about your heart attack. I've done a lot of speaking engagements with you, and I've heard about it. But I want I want you to tell everybody what it was like and. Right. Um, the story because I, I think it's very very powerful and it will impact a lot of people. Well, um, retired from coaching, you know, mutually, you know, they said we mutually agreed to part <laughs> ways in Georgia. <laughs> Here's the deal: if they pay you, they fired you. <laughs> if you don't get paid, uh, you, you retired. But uh, I left Georgia and then I went to the University of Miami. I uh, thought I'd take a year off and 
and uh, rest. I need I needed rest. I knew I was exhausted in a lot of ways, but within forty eight hours, I was the head coach at Miami, and uh, so we went into that. All so was in. that a struggle? I mean, was that a uh, alma mater? Obviously, that means a ton. Well, after the news broke that I was on the market, so to speak, as far as universities were concerned, I, uh, there was probably six or seven schools that were looking for coaches uh, contacted me, and I was I was thinking about um, you know visiting this school, visiting that school, and and see what's up. And then when I got down to it, I'm like. There's only one school I'd probably re- truthfully consider at this point, and that was that was Miami. And it wasn't so much because it was my alma mater, is because you, you can win in Miami, you can recruit at Miami, you can. Miami's got a lot of issues they need to catch up on, uh, and they're getting there right now. We made some progress, and Coach Cristobal's making more progress. But uh, you know, it was a school that I thought you could win, and uh, usually schools that have won in the past can win in the future, and and that was one of the biggest reasons. But once I got to Miami. The fact that it was my alma mater became a lot, a lot more important to me. Um, so we took that job, and what happened was I, I had no um, guardrails, so to speak, on my time. Uh, it was just Catherine and I. It, it, there was no more children to take to school every day and make sure I spent time with mm-hmm. them. And So the, the balance that I really had when my children were in the home was gone because I was like, well, I can, I can work 24 seven. And I, you know, I decided I'm going to coach quarterbacks again. I'm going to call plays again. I'm going to, you know, raise funds. I'm going to do all these things. And we did it, man. We were cranking. And then about three years in, I crashed. Um, and um, I describe it as an extreme fatigue that I'd never had uh, had in the past. And I felt like if I kept going at that pace, something bad was going to happen to me. And, truth of the matter was something bad already did happen to me I just didn't know what it was we might talk about that later but getting back to the heart attack story I, you know I, I retired from coaching we go to the beach we decide to live in Destin we have a little routine 30 minute walk to the gym little old man workout you know in the weights and then 30 minutes <laughs> I can, walk I can back relate home. to that when he says we he means him and Catherine yeah that's right exactly. Catherine's the best and so um one day I'm in there and uh, I'm doing my last set in the weight room and um, I'm doing shoulder shrugs after some military press. And I was doing sets of 15. I got to about 11 or 12, and I, I just couldn't go anymore. And I had to sit down and catch my breath. And then I got nauseous, and I was, like, a little upset with Catherine because she made me take all these vitamins in the morning before we'd walk. I'm like, that's why I'm nauseous. But uh, I said, honey, I got to go in, in the boys' room. I'm, I'm not feeling good. So I go in there. There's one stall. I go do what I got to do. Uh, a little while into it, somebody knocks on the door. There's only one. Me being the nice guy, I let him use the boys' room. And I sat on the bench in the locker room, and I got more hot, more heated, um, was sweating profusely, was still getting nauseous. Um, And I felt that chest pressure that you hear about. And I'm like, I think I'm having a heart attack. If I don't call for help, I'm in trouble. So I called help. And it was like crickets. Um... The guy had come and gone. I'm the only guy in the in the uh, locker room, so I'm like, I'm gonna have to get up and walk to where the people are. I'm probably gonna die right here. So, got up, did that deal, uh, made it to the weight room area where the people were, and called out for help and got on my knee and my rear and my back and just to feel the coolness of the tile because I was so hot. They come up to, should we call the ambulance? Yeah. Should we uh, drink this water, coach? I'm like, just pour it on me. You know, so the ambulance comes up. I'm thinking they're going to stick something in me and make me go to sleep and I'll wake up when it's over. But they couldn't get uh, a stick in me. And uh, we were about a mile and a half from the hospital, which was very good. And uh, got to the uh, operating room, and I thought they were going to put me out there. And But my blood pressure went so low, they were afraid I would code, which is code for dying. And uh, so... Um, you know, they left the, the uh, EMTs in there, whatever you call them, with the little shock machine just in case because my blood pressure went so low. But So I'm laying there on the table conscious as they're putting three stents into my widow maker and then uh, one stent into another artery, two 100% blocked, as it turned out. And I'm laying there with my eyes closed, and I could feel the lights through my eyelids uh, in the operating table. And I, I hear this voice saying, Coach, what are you feeling? 
And I'm like, well, well, my left arm went numb and I can't breathe. And then, then my right arm, then my right leg, then my right left leg. Then, coach, what are you feeling? My head and my my eyes are uh, are going numb. And, and it was kind of like the lights went out. Uh, uh, I went numb. Uh, I, I really, it was pitch black dark. And uh, I'm thinking this is it. And um, so... I guess the, the the main thing about this story is when I was in that last moment that I felt like, you know, I was about to die, I felt this overwhelming sense of peace uh, that I knew where I was going. That, mm-hmm. that uh, not only was I peaceful, I was excited. I remember, I remember saying in my spirit, you know, here I come Jesus, you know, <laughs> fired up, ready to go. And um, so, um, you know, that decision I made in 1986 to, receive Christ was real. And I, I never doubted it. And I want to make something clear too, that, you know, if you're at the moment of truth, you think you're about to die and you're scared of dying, it doesn't mean you're not a believer by any means. But, but I felt that sense of peace and it was almost an out of body experience. I'm in my spirit. I'm, I'm feeling this sense of peace. And in the distance, I can hear my body gasping for air. You know, God designs our bodies to want to live, you know, but, but in my spirit, I was ready to go. And then I heard, wake up. I didn't know if it was Jesus or Satan. <laughs> and it was actually the nurse. But, uh, neither. Neither. And so uh, I woke up. But, I, you know, I left that experience um, very, very thankful. Not so much that God spared my life at that moment. It was just the, the peace that I felt that, that I knew it was real. I knew where I was going. And, and that's the point also I wanted to make was when you get to that point in your life where you think it's the end there's only one thing that's important and that's where you're going to go and I knew where I was going and it was going to be an awesome place and uh, I was just so thankful for that I already already wanted to tell people about Jesus I already wanted to tell people about Jesus but uh, it just multiplied after that day Hmm. that's awesome so let's talk about 1986 what was it that led you to well, I'll try to tell that. I'll try to tell that one quickly. But uh, oh. I was a young graduate assistant coach at Florida State under Coach Bobby Bowden. Had an open date, second season in early in the year. Uh, coach Bowden said, "Go home for the weekend. Come back on Sunday for a team meeting." Uh, some kids went home. Some kids stayed in town. The ones that stayed in town uh, went to a party on campus. Somebody pulls the fire alarm. Everybody's out in the in the parking lot. Some kid races through the lot. Uh, who wasn't even a student, uh, a local as they call him, with a car full of buddies, almost hits one of the players, Pablo Lopez, 6'5", 285, left tackle, uh, starter, NFL-bound kind of guy. Uh, Great personality. Everybody loved him. You know, red, yellow, black, white, didn't matter. Everybody loved Pablo, kind of a jokester, but he had a hard edge too. And, uh, of course, he didn't like almost getting run over by the car and – got in the driver's side door and threatened to kick the guy's butt. And um, he uh, uh, just kind of walked away, didn't think much about it. Well, the kid wasn't about to come out of the car and try to physically fight Pablo and his teammates. So he gets his pride hurt in front of his buddies, and he decides he's going to uh, go back home, get a sawed-off shotgun, bring it back to the party, put it under the car uh, of one of the players, and, and told his buddies to get to – everybody's back in the party back by then – and he said, hey, go tell the guys I'm messing with their car. So they come out, Pablo leading the pack. And uh, the guy, when he gets close enough, the guy pulls the gun. Try, just try to get Pablo to back down in front of his buddies. Like he had to back down in front of his friends. And uh, it's all about pride, obviously. And, um, and Pablo won't go back down. And I was told, he, he walked up to him with his arms out. And he just says, you're not going to shoot me, bro. Sure enough, the kid panicked and, and shot Pablo, and Pablo, Pablo was DOA. And um, so the next day we got the meeting. I'm, I'm the young graduate assistant coach taking role. I'm in the back of the room. Everything was assigned seating at that time. You know, first team offense in the first row, first team defense in the second row, and so on. And uh, Coach Bowden addressed the team, and he was he was very hurt, like everybody was. And he said, man, I don't know where Pablo is right now. I don't know where he'll spend eternity. Um, he goes, but I do know that there's a God that loves us who created us and wants a relationship with us and wants us to spend 
eternity with him in heaven. But uh, the problem is when Adam sinned, sin entered all of us, and uh, we're kind of doomed to fail. We're not, the you know, the standard for heaven is perfection, and we're not perfect. We can't be uh, because of Adam's sin. And so basically he just spread the gospel to the guy saying, but God knew that problem we had, and that's why he gave us Jesus. And Jesus, by the way, I think you all know this, but he was not born of Adam like we were. He was born of the Holy Spirit. So he was that perfect person, the perfect sacrifice for all sin for all time, you know. So he's like, That's, that chair is empty right now. I mean, he said, Pablo used to sit in that chair, and now he's gone. He goes, you guys are 18 to 22 years old. You think you're going to live forever just like Pablo thought he was going to live forever. He said, but if that was you last night instead of Pablo, do you know where you'd spend eternity? And uh, he was talking to the team, but uh, the Holy Spirit was speaking to me through some seeds that were planted by a teammate of mine back in Miami years earlier. And uh, I knew where I was going to go, and it was not a good place. And so the next day I knocked on Coach Bowden's door, and he invited the players to talk about it if they wanted to. And I said, I know I'm not a player, but can I talk to you? And, of course, when, when I knocked on the door, he said, he said, come on in, buddy. He calls you buddy when he forgets your name. <laughs> but um, anyway, I said, I said, Mark. No. But uh, anyway, I, I said, Coach, I need Jesus. And uh, so I prayed to receive Christ that day, and things changed. I went from a very uh, cocky, self-centered guy to somebody who was other-centered and, uh, and Christ-centered. And I had a, new, had a new goal in life, and that was to try to live my life in a way that would please God. Just real simple live my life in a way that God would be pleased. And uh, not an easy goal, but a simple goal. And that's that's really how I've tried to operate ever since. I love that story of how Coach Bowden took a difficult situation and was able, able to share the gospel. Right. And how all things work together for the good of those who love God who have been called according to, to his purpose. Right. So did Coach Bowden obviously had a huge impact on your life. Oh, yeah. Coach Bowden, uh, you know, he allowed me to coach quarterbacks at a Power 5 school. They didn't call it Power 5 back then. but So I'm, I'm a first-year graduate assistant coach, and I'm, the goal for me was to help Coach Bowden coach the quarterbacks because that's how he structured his staff. And uh, he went to the first meeting with me, and he went, he followed me around practice the first day, and he never, he never came back. So he let me coach those guys. So he gave me that opportunity in the coaching business to not only coach, but to be under somebody like him who did things the right way. And then, uh, but he also more importantly led me to Christ and, uh, you know, bless me for all of eternity. That's incredible. And coach Bowden, it's, it's interesting, you know, and I, th I think this is pretty cool because I think people are going to say the same thing about you too, is my son, <clears throat> when coach Bowden passed away, I was like, I was like, do you know who Coach Bobby Bowden is? He was like, no, sir. Right. Um, <clears throat> and I said, uh, I said he was Coach Rick's coach, or he he helped Coach Rick become a coach. I said Coach Rick was my coach. I said there are people lined up at the gates of heaven. I said to welcome him in because of him. I was like, I, I said I can't explain to you how you never met him. I said, but he had an impact on our lives. Like, right. and so I think it's kind of crazy that same is going to be said about you. You know, well, I hope so. It is. You, you too, David. And you too, Pastor. <laughs> Pastor Jay. Oh, only one. If it's just one, it'll be worth it. All right. So so you you had Pablo, um, you had Georgia, you had Miami, um, T V star. How, how did that come about, by the way? How did Coach Rick the the coach become become in <laughs> yeah. T going to well, T V? You know, the ACC network network was just starting up and I had it just left the ACC at Miami. And I coached at Florida State for 15 years with Coach Bowden. And um, close to half of those years, we were in the ACC. So uh, they were looking for a, a group to the, – the group – the show we have is called The Huddle. And uh, they needed an old token coach. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it just so happened I was available after retiring. Uh, so uh, my agent, who helped me with some football contracts, also – had a very close relationship with ESPN, and uh, we got we had a little interview, and they said they said they wanted me. You liked it? Yeah, I do like it. It's fun. I, I like it mostly because 
because of the guys I'm working with. E.J. Manuel, former quarterback, Florida State. Uh, Eric McLean, a former lineman at Clemson, and then a big guy. Uh, they're all big dudes, actually. But uh, Jordan Cornette was a former basketball player in Notre Dame. He's the host of the show. And we just, we just have a good time. Um, the goal is to educate and entertain. You know that, David. And uh, so we do a little, little bit of educating, but a, a lot of uh, entertainment. I hope. We have a lot of fun. I tell I tell David this all the time, but because of because he has such a strong faith, he's impacting way more people than he even knows. There's no doubt, and, and you're impacting way more people. Coach Rick's probably the number one requested person to be on our podcast. People keep asking, me, "We're going to get Coach Rick. We're going to get Coach Rick." So you've had a huge impact on people. That's good. I mean, that's what you hope for, and uh, you know, it does start with your family. It starts with your spouse. It starts. Then, you know, moves to your children, and, uh, you know, that's our first responsibility. You know, as we know, marriage is the first relationship God created, and uh, he, he takes it very seriously, and he has a job for us to do as men, and that's to lead and to, uh, you know, lead in a sacrificial way, hmm. the way Christ sacrificed for the church, and that's the part that a lot of men don't get. Uh, they feel like, I'm the leader, you need to follow me. But uh, you need to be worthy of being followed, actually. And, uh, and the type of leadership God's asking us men is to, you know, sacrifice for our wife and our children. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's worthy of being followed. I know your wife was the water, the water, water, girl, girl, water yeah. girl at Georgia. How did, how did that come she's about? A stud. Yeah, she's amazing. Well, she, when I was coaching quarterback, she, she could easily – make cookies for the QB room, you know, and then I became coordinator and that role became bigger. And she, she always wanted to, you know, have the guys over for a barbecue or whatever, do something to uh, let the guys know that we care, excuse me, that we care about them. And when you come become head coach, it's just kind of overwhelming the number of guys and it's hard to figure out a way to fit in. And she'll say that was part of the reason that she wanted to serve in some way, shape, or form, and get to know the players better. But she'll say a lot of it also was when you go to away games, you're sitting in the stands, and when once the mm. fan base realizes you're the head coach's wife of the opposing team, you know it's not it's not the most fun place to be is up in the stands. And so she was uh, at a game uh, a couple hours before the game, and she was with uh, Barbara Dooley, the AD's wife. And uh, the other thing too is. They would always invite for her to go in the AD's box. But if the head coach's wife is in there and the AD's in there and the president's in there, the all the people that might have something to say or or maybe won't say it because the head coach's wife is there, she never felt comfortable. So one pregame, she saw everybody working on the the water table, so to speak, all the train managers and trainers setting up for the game. And she's like, you know what, I could do that. And so Ron Corston, the director of sports medicine, she asked, uh, I said, you got to ask him. <laughs> I said, if, if I ask him, there's less of a chance. But, I mean, you know, you can impose your will, but I wanted Ron to be 100% with him. So she asked him if she could help out. And just so everybody knows, she didn't just show up and pour water. She <laughs> show that bus goes, that bus of managers and trainers go to the game at least four hours in advance, four to six hours in advance, and there's a lot of work. So she did a lot of that. She worked like everybody else, I guess, is what, what uh, she would Hope everybody understands. Well, it's a very Christ-like thing to ser serve other people. Actually, my sermon this Sunday, I'm talking about the pathway to greatness is through servanthood. Right. And, of course, Jesus <clears throat> models that for us. He washes his disciples' feet on the night that he was betrayed. And so she's following the example of Jesus, ser serving the entire team in a very humble, yes. humble she's way. All, she's all about that. High quality H two O, right? High quality H two O. Some people will know what we're talking about. You got to know that reference. You should. That's right. Thank you for listening to this week's Family Goals podcast with Davey Pollock and Pastor Jay. Coach Mark Rick has impacted tens of thousands of people, and it's always encouraging to see someone with such a platform as Mark's living it for Jesus. Coach truly lives a life worth emulating, and his legacy goes much further than just coaching football. It's changing lives for all eternity. I want to challenge you today. Just as Coach Rick's wife served in many roles from baking cookies for the team to being the water girl, what are some ways that you can serve those around you as well as your church? 
If you do not have a church home, we invite you to come to Greystone and get connected. We would love for you to serve alongside us. Thank you again for tuning in to part one of our episode with Coach Mark Rick. Check back next week for part two.